Hi there, my name is Dr. Heather Rader. I'm a pelvic physical therapist, and I'm here to present the treatment of pelvic pain and sexual dysfunction in chronic CES, a physical therapy approach. Let's review our learning objectives. Number one, understand the difference between underactive and overactive pelvic floor muscle symptoms. Number two, determine the difference between Kegel exercises and pelvic physical therapy. Number three, learn how pelvic physical therapy can treat pelvic pain syndromes and sexual dysfunction. And four, how to discover where to find a pelvic physical therapist. And along the way, we're going to answer some questions and define some terms. What is pelvic health physical therapy? And what are these pelvic floor dysfunctions you're talking about? Uh, what pelvic floor problems specifically are associated with CES? What are these Kegel exercises I hear about? And, and can they help somebody with CES? And how in the world does a physical therapist treat pelvic pain, bladder pain, bowel issues, sexual pain? How does a pelvic physical therapist do that? Pelvic health physical therapy has been a recognized specialty in the U.S. since 1977, and our colleagues in England have been an organized profession since 1948, so they're quite uh, a few decades ahead of us. And ironically, 1948 is the year that Dr. Kegel published his first paper in the United States, so we'll talk about uh, that interesting history. It is a post-professional training, and pelvic health physical therapists uh, typically uh, are experts in three main areas, uh, pelvic floor muscle dysfunction, treating both underactive and overactive symptoms. Underactive typically include incontinence, pelvic organ prolapse, and overactive pelvic pain syndromes, urinary retention issues, and constipation, or both. And very often people have symptoms of both. And then it becomes an order, uh, an issue of which order that you're treating, not either or. Um, and then also pelvic girdle problems. Uh, we tend to be very uh, good at treating SI problems, tailbone problems, pubic symphysis issues. And the connection between the pelvic floor and the abdominal wall is profound. And so a lot of us are also treating within that area, uh, postpartum diastasis recti, endometriosis, abdominal adhesions are, are things that we typically are treating as well. So a little bit about me and my background as a pelvic health physical therapist. Well, I started as a normal physical therapist. I graduated from the University of Miami in 1994, and I was very lucky to have an internship with one of the pioneers in the field. And so I began my pelvic health journey pretty early. Uh, since the, since the mid-90s, I have been involved in public health, and I've seen a lot of positive change over the decades. Uh, I received my doctorate in physical therapy from the University of St. Augustine in 2011. And I hold certifications in pelvic rehabilitation and the use of biofeedback for pelvic floor muscle dysfunction. I'm a clinic owner of the OBPT clinic in Eustis, Florida, which is in the central Florida area and where we specialize in pregnancy, postpartum, and pelvic physical therapy. I'm senior faculty with the Herman and Wallace Pelvic Rehabilitation Institute, doing some of that post-professional training we just spoke about, and I teach in their pelvic floor and pregnancy series once or twice a month. And I've also done some advocacy via a TED Talk where we talked about overactive pelvic floor muscles, which is going to be a big topic uh, that we speak about, um, called How to Save Someone from a Pelvic Floor Muscle Attack. It's av available on, on YouTube, of course, and it's kind of a 10-minute summary of, of what this talk will, will be. So uh, uh, check it out. So next we're going to talk about pelvic floor muscle anatomy. And sometimes it's easier to think of this not as a floor, but more as a door. So the pelvic floor muscles uh, form a sling when we're looking at it from side to side, uh, from the pubic bone to the tailbone. And there are openings through the pelvic floor muscles, uh, the urethra and the anus for uh, bowel and bladder elimination. And in the female anatomy, we have a hole for the vagina for reproductive functions. Just like any other muscle, the pelvic floor muscles can be underactive or overactive. And so with underactive pelvic floor muscles, 
when they're on the weaker side and have poor strength, the symptoms might be, I can't close my sphincter tight enough voluntarily and urine comes out. I lose fecal matter or I can't control gas the way I used to in social situations anymore. Um, but that's not the only thing that can go wrong with a muscle. They can also lack endurance and a pelvic floor muscle with not great endurance might manifest itself as the symptom of I can't make it to the bathroom on time. I can't hold it long enough anymore. Um, it's also associated with pelvic organ prolapse. So when people are have to be on their feet all day uh, for some reason, the prolapse symptoms tend to be worse. Remember the pelvic floor is a posture muscle. It's the bottom of our core. So if it's directly in the line of gravity, then that can uh, make it work harder. And so having better endurance can help alleviate some of those symptoms. Muscles can also have poor coordination. And a lot of times with pelvic floor dysfunctions, that's really what I'm treating, not weakness, but poor coordination. So the timing is crucial. So uh, the pelvic floor muscles have to squeeze really quick to prevent leakage with a sneeze or a cough or, or lifting something um, heavy. And, and so that order matters and the the timing and the order in which muscles contract matters for the entire continence mechanism uh, so so having good coordination is crucial for great bladder control overactive pelvic floor muscles can be characterized by tenderness. Uh, people will complain of sitting pain. I, I don't like to sit on uh, anymore. And you are sitting on your pelvic floor muscles. So if they're overactive and, and grumpy, then you can understand why they wouldn't want to touch other things, just like other sore parts of our body might uh, avoid uh, touch when it's sore. Um, Underwear sensitivity and clothes sensitivity is not uncommon as well. So that area is so tender that they can't tolerate cl uh, tight clothing. Sometimes my patients just have the goal of, I just want to wear a pair of jeans again. Um, so that, that types of stuff. Tenderness to even cleaning yourself after bathroom use. Uh, uh, women not being able to wear tampons anymore it's, uh, and, and, and that. Uh, trouble with speculum examinations for that yearly pap smear or when guys get screened for prostate cancer, the digital rectal examination. Now, they're not fun for anybody, but it shouldn't make you hurt for five days afterwards. So if I hear that, um, that that's going to lead me to think we've got an overactive pelvic floor. And then sexual activities. And sometimes it's described as a superficial official right at the opening. And then sometimes it's more of a deep pain and sometimes both. So sitting issues, uh, issues with uh, toileting or sphincteric issues, and sexual issues as to where they're having their pain. And then from my perspective as a therapist, what am I going to find clinically? I typically can feel muscle spasming. I can feel those pelvic floor muscles spasming. There's typically a, a guarding um, appearance, so a drawing in of the entire uh, perineum because of, of the guarding phenomena. Um, I can sometimes feel bands of tight fascia because the muscles have been crunched together for so long that the fascia can, uh, has adapted and we, we call that adaptive shortening of the tissue and, and the muscles kind of get trapped uh, in there and so can so can nerves and so it can give you some nervy pain just by having mild fascial problems. Uh, tension and really what we're saying is that it doesn't have normal range of motion. If it was a, a shoulder or knee we're saying it can't go through the full range of motion and so that restriction in the pelvic floor leads to um, those openings being squished or pinched and the urine stream might be slow or thready or stop and start um, you might have what's called obstructed constipation, meaning the body has made stool, it's down there, it's just, it, you just feel like you can't get it out rather than it took forever for it to get down there. So obstructive constipation. And then painful uh, sexual activity uh, as well. So those symptoms all cluster together. 
And I think one of the most important things I could teach you about the pelvic floor muscles are their job as part of your general defense mechanism. They are a threat meter. They, whether that threat is mental, anxiety, stress, panic, worry, or physical uh, pain nearby, your pelvic floor muscles are primitively going to tense and tighten to hopefully protect you. So a wonderful study by Vandervelt in 2001 looked at this phenomena and they had women who had uh, documented pelvic pain syndromes and women who had no pelvic pain and put biofeedback sensors on their pelvic floor muscles uh, as well as their trapezius muscles and and expose them to different sights and sounds. And the more threatening the sights and sounds became, violent images, sexually threatening images, horror music, uh, blood and guts kind of stuff, the more threatening it got, the tighter those pelvic floor muscles got in everybody whether they had pain or not. So that tells us it's normal for this muscle to be on the protective side. So when people don't get an answer as to what's wrong with them, their body is under constant threat, sometimes that's the only thing that caused the pelvic floor muscle tension to begin in the first place. So physically or mentally, physically, it's, it's like this nosy neighbor that has to be involved in a little bit of everything. So what's going on over here in the hip? What's going on, on uh, here in the, in the back? Oh, you're in pain? I'm going to tense uh, for you to be your protective guard dog. Um, Mayo Clinic developed this term called tension myalgia, which I think is a, a great way to describe this, that there is general tension within this muscle, and that tension going on for so long has now caused muscle pain or myalgia. So the problem with this phenomena is that the pelvic floor has connections to almost everything in your body, which is why the pelvic floor can be this diagnostic on and off ramp for so many conditions. And we see pelvic floor problems cluster with so many other issues within the body itself. Uh, but because there's really not a pelvic floor physician, uh, it doesn't get looked at as the unit, rather it gets looked at as a bladder issue or a bowel issue, or um, this is related to your irritable bowel syndrome, or this is related to your back pain and, and the like. And very often it's it's the pelvic floor that is, is the big problem. Um, and that's causing secondary issues in these other arenas. So there's a lot to examine. There's a lot of places to look for clues as to what's going on. Not. So these are some of the common statistics that I routinely am sharing with, with patients and colleagues about how the pelvic floor is intertwined with so many aspects of health. So remember what we said about mental health. 50% uh, of trauma survivors have a pelvic pain uh, condition documented, so one in two. The general population is roughly about one in, in uh, five or 20% have some sort of pelvic pain, so much higher in, in trauma survivors. Um, the notion that pelvic problems, uh, pelvic floor problems only happen to little old ladies. No, um, uh, here we go. 50% of elite athletes have urinary incontinence. So being fit isn't a protection from uh, pelvic floor problems. Uh, it, and it doesn't just happen to women. Men have pelvic floors as well. One in five men have urinary incontinence. Um, Highly related to balance and fall risk. Older adults that wake up to use the toilet at night two times or more have double the fall risk. So it's a big deal that people wake up at night and physical therapy can go a long way to minimize nocturia symptoms. Um, the link between breathing conditions and, and pelvic floor dysfunction. Having COPD or other things that make you cough quite a bit five times more likely to have incontinence. So we see that breathing diaphragm and pelvic floor uh, relationship be very important. Low back pain is a big, uh, has a big association with pelvic floor dysfunction. Uh, low back pain is more associated with those breathing disorders and urinary incontinence than being sedentary. Um, so 
what that's telling us is this is more of a core issue, that pelvic core versus just pelvic floor. It's part of a bigger picture. Uh, so we see breathing, the breathing diaphragm, we see the abdominal uh, wall muscles, we see the pelvic floor, and we see the back muscles all working together as a core. So if there's something wrong with one of those four elements, it can manifest into problems in the other and cause, cause those issues, which is why we see these cluster together. Um, an interesting study that looked at people that were going to outpatient physical therapy for low back pain who consented to have a pelvic floor muscle screening, an internal assessment of their pelvic floor muscles, 68% of them had pelvic floor muscle tenderness. So it's not good to isolate these things as only a back issue or only a pelvic floor issue because that's not how the body is addressing it. Uh, but we do like to segment things and unfortunately that, that, that tendency doesn't always help with these more complex problems. Uh, about 25% of low back pain is uh, really misdiagnosed and it's really SI joint uh, dysfunction. And, and so I consider that more of a pelvic problem than a back problem and I, and I treat it differently. Um, there's an extremely high association between labral tears in the hip and vulvar pain syndromes, which means they both get misdiagnosed. So I've had patients that have had unnecessary hip surgery because it was really a vulvar problem and and vulvar uh, diagnoses that have had creams and, and 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 all kinds of medicine and done nothing and it really was a, a hip problem so physical therapists we're going to look at all of these arenas and yes that uh, tailbone trauma you had as a kid could still impact how your pelvic floor is working today um, if you uh, had trauma and it, it healed funny or has always been kind of tender then yeah you adapt but then other things happen to your body childbirth see yeah something and now your body can't compensate uh, anymore so yes it can still make a difference so so all of these elements um, ha come into play when I'm seeing somebody so um, um, that's why I kind of laugh when people uh, say that this is the same as Kegel exercises. So that's a question I get. Is it my fill in the blank? Is it because I had kids? Is it because I have caught Aquinas syndrome? Uh, is it because I don't exercise? Is it because I have a prostate problem? It could be a little bit of all of these. And so I can, we can investigate in terms of when your symptoms started, but it's never fair to say that one thing caused all of these uh, issues. So there's usually a lot of other risk factors that are going on. So we do, we look at your age, we look at your OBGYN history, we look at what's going on with your prostate, um, the level of functioning you have. There are studies with other neurological conditions that link uh, the worsening of the walking problem linking with the bladder problem. So sometimes it's related to how the whole trunk is working as a unit. Um, is it a core instability issue? Is it a hip issue? Are we dealing with neurological rigidity or spasticity? One of the things I often say is that strokes don't skip the pelvic floor. So a lot of times people will get sent to physical therapy and occupational therapy a million times for their neurological condition, but then the bladder is just, oh, that's neurogenic. There's nothing you can do for that and then skip it. But it could have been a pelvic floor problem that could have really done well with rehab. So we don't know until we try. Um, is, are, is it because you have pain and the muscles are just not moving because they hurt, making them weak and uncoordinated? So there's so many things to look at. It's very hard to say, aha, this is all because of one thing. Let's review some bladder symptoms that are linked to pelvic floor dysfunction, which means these are symptoms that I regularly treat as a pelvic floor therapist, however people got them. Uh, frequency, urinary frequency, that's a symptom that means that you are urinating uh, more than um, eight times a day or mathematically less than every two hours. Uh, urgency is different than urge. We all have urges to go. We're all potty trained. That's how uh, uh, we know to go. 
urgency is a symptom, not a signal. And urgency is a immediate and sudden, I cannot defer it. It's like you've the fullness you feel if you've held it for two hours and you really got to go, that happens like that. That's, that's urgency. Uh, nocturia, that means that you are getting up two times or, nor, or, or more, waking two times or more to urinate. And remember, we saw, saw that that's a highly linked with fall risk in older adults. And then incontinence or leakage. Uh, there are many types. The most common are stress, urge, and mixed incontinence. Uh, stress incontinence would be better named exertional incontinence. So uh, coughing, sneezing, picking up something heavy, exercise induced leakage. Urge, that's happening with that urge. I can't make it on, on time to the bathroom. And mixed means you have symptoms of both. You might also hear the phrase overactive bladder, and that's just kind of a sim syndrome term that really could be any or all of, of the above that we just mentioned. So those are more on the storage side of bladder function. And then we have the emptying side of bladder function. And that's when those pelvic floor muscles have to coordinatedly get out of the way. So they have to have range of motion to get out of the way and coordination to get out of the way for you to completely empty. So that I don't feel empty. I feel like I have to push to get my bladder empty. Uh, power peeing, we sometimes call that. Um, there may be pain with urination uh, and, and, and the like. So there's a syndrome called uh, bl bladder pain syndrome um, and then used to be called interstitial cystitis, but we're seeing that term uh, disappear a bit. Basically, it feels like you have a UTI, but there's absolutely no infection. So it's this chronic inflammation, um, but a big portion of those people, it's really not the bladder itself, but the pelvic floor muscles mimicking bladder pain. Uh, so the long story short, a pelvic floor muscle dysfunction can mimic infectious types of feelings, which makes the diagnosis even harder um, um, in the doctor's defense. So. Um, so those are some symptoms that definitely pelvic floor therapy can help with. Some bowel symptoms linked with pelvic floor muscle dysfunction. Uh, frequency or infrequency of your bowel movements. Normal frequency is not once a day. Normal frequency varies from person to person and situation to situation from uh, three times a day to three times a week. So that's the normal range. So people can have a bowel movement once a day and still qualify for constipation if they have to strain a lot, they don't feel like they've emptied, it hurts, they get abdominal discomfort, that, those are all part of the constipation uh, picture. Um, you can also have fecal urgency, just like you can with the bladder, um, and you can lose control of, of your uh, gas when you're in social situations. Some folks will do absolutely fine if their uh, fecal matter is on in the normal solid form, but if they ate something that made them a little on the looser side, then they can't control it. Um, so those are different manifestations of fecal incontinence. Um, taking a long time to go. Uh, there's a lot you can do as far as your toileting posture uh, to make it easier for your body to go. Um, ideally, you should be done in about five minutes. If it's taking longer than 10 or 15 minutes, there may be some treatable issues there. And genital pain syndromes linked to pelvic floor muscle dysfunction. So. Painful sex is a uh, diagnosis I treat quite a bit, and typically it in, comes in a couple of different forms. Typically superficial or deep uh, are the way people describe their sexual pain. So it hurts uh, with vaginal penetration or anal penetration uh, right at the opening, or it hurts uh, very deeply in my pelvis and it's a little difficult for me to even pinpoint where it is. Um, does it happen during the arousal phase, erection phase? Uh, does it happen at the moment of orgasm? So these are all clues as to what part of the pelvic floor might be having trouble. So other things that I might see, prostatitis, 
A lot of prostate infections are deemed non-bacterial, meaning that there is, really wasn't ever an infection. They're just kind of calling it infection because they didn't know what else to call it. Turns out a lot of those infections were really a tight pelvic floor all along. So uh, we'll talk more about what the American Neurological Association is recommending nowadays, uh, Not and it's not antibiotic. So um, pedendal neuralgia. The pedendal nerve is the primary nerve to the pelvic floor. Uh, comes off of the sacral roots S234. I learned in physical therapy school that S234 keeps poop and pee off the floor. Uh, so yes, that pedendal nerve is in, in crucial for bowel and bladder control, um, but it's also very superficial. So it can, it's really prone to compression injuries. So sometimes it's called cyclist syndrome because they're so prone to, to getting it because they sit on those little tiny hard bike, bike seats and the nerves get squished and, and irritated. Uh, lots of gynecological conditions, uh, endometriosis, vulvodynia, uh, dyspareunia, vaginismus, and pelvic organ prolapse would all fall into that. Pelvic organ prolapse doesn't hurt in the traditional way that we think of pain. It's typically described as this heaviness or pressure, but it certainly is uncomfortable. But people tend to say, well, no, it's not a pain pain. It's this pressure pain that's typically related to uh, pelvic organ prolapse. So as a pelvic health therapist, I'm taking all of those screening questions about the bowel, bladder, and, and genital function, and then looking at their body from a movement system. So movement system is the new way that we're saying the musculoskeletal system. Um, so I'm looking at the pelvic floor muscles. There's over 24 different pelvic floor muscles in three different layers. So there's a lot even to examine in the, just the pelvic floor. Um, and then I get to look at their attachments to the hip, the spine, um, how is it functioning as a core muscle and, and breath control? Uh, and then the individual things about the pelvic floor muscles themselves, its strength, endurance, coordination, its range of motion and ability to, to move in a timely manner. Uh, what's going on with the, the bony alignment, the joints, the SI joint, the spinal joints, the hip joints? Um, there are a lot of uh, pelvic pain referral patterns that mimic spinal dermatome. So in some ways, Cotaquina syndrome is kind of demystified for a pelvic therapist compared to a lot of other practitioners because we're always asking about bowel, bladder, and genital function. We're always screening for uh, for uh, neurological signs within the, the genitalia. So, so uh, as I was saying, I, I do think that uh, we are underutilized as a uh, as an avenue for diagnosis to at least rule out that the pelvic floor is a contributing factor to pelvic pain. So, and then another thing that we look at is fascia, um, the connective tissue that surrounds uh, muscles and, and actually a little bit of everything in your body. Um, it's, it's kind of uh, like saran wrap, uh, uh, kind of holding uh, things together. So it's quite sticky on a chemical level, which means that if you shorten it for a long periods of time, like pain posturing, you tend to fold in on yourself if you hurt, then it, it shortens, it gets tight. And so the muscles are kind of, and nerves are kind of trapped within this fascia and then they can't move and expand and, 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 and function the way that they're supposed to. So they kind of get squished in there. So if we do stretches and manual therapy to lengthen that fascia, very, very often those symptoms can go away. So we take the systemic issues of the bowel, bladder, and genitalia and then put the movement system uh, findings on top of that and see what uh, therapeutic interventions we can have from there. So if I had a nickel for every time I was asked this question, isn't pelvic therapy the same as Kegel exercises? No, it's not, not even a little bit. So Kegel exercises are the in contraction of the pelvic floor and then the drop. So it's pretty much the same as a bicep curl, all right? So can you imagine? all the things that can go wrong with somebody's shoulder. You could have a stroke, you could break your arm, you could have an overuse rotator cuff uh, injury. What if the orthopedic and neurological doctors only gave you a brochure that says to do bicep curls at red lights or in line at the grocery store whenever you think about it? It's laughable when we put the same standard on other parts of the body that just flipping your floor up and down whenever you think about it could, Im could impact all of the different things that go wrong within the pelvis, the pelvic girdle, the pelvic floor, 
let alone the pelvic organs themselves. So there's so much more, more to it than just uh, doing Kegel exercises. So we're going to dive into that a bit deeper here. So I say this a lot. The reason Kegels fail people are the exact same reasons why pelvic physical therapy succeeds. Um, and when people have an individualized approach to their pelvic health, rather than getting a generalized brochure on what to do, they're 17 times more likely to report a cure or improvement in their symptoms. Uh, so it, it makes sense. If you're in, your, your treatment is individualized, you're going to do better. And so the pelvic floor is no exception to that concept. So let's talk about the history of Kegel exercises. So Dr. Kegel, the namesake to Kegel exercises here in the United States, was not an OBGYN. He was a thyroid surgeon and uh, trained with the Dr. Mayo of Mayo Clinic uh, back in the day. He was uh, the health commissioner of Chicago, so he was quite famous in his own right before he became our famous Dr. Kegel. Nor did he invent pelvic floor exercises. What he did invent was a tool to measure how effective the pelvic floor exercises were called the perineometer. Um, so he uh, um, did research for almost 20 years perfecting this and finally published in 1948. And he called the exercises physiologic exercises. So here we can see what he invented. It's called the perineometer. So it was an internal vaginal pressure sensor and um, it would go inside the woman's vagina and then it was uh, there was a, a tube that was then connected to basically a blood pressure cuff uh, monitor so you would see the little needle move when you would squeeze with your pelvic floor muscles with this internal sensor so dr kegel and his research team were able were able to get numbers for the first time on how much power they were generating um, and then seeing progress over time the patient themselves could be assured that they were using the right muscle for the first time because of where the sensor was um, Dr. Kegel would verify visually and palpation wise to make sure they were using the right muscle. So when he says do exercises, it wasn't doing the exercises. It was doing the exercises with a tool that allowed you to see what you were doing. And you had one on one training and it was progress based on what uh, what your numbers were, what your progress was. Those are the real Kegel exercises. So what I'm doing as a pelvic therapist is just taking what he did and putting a more modern spin on it. We certainly know a lot more about the pelvic floor than we did back in the 40s. We knew a lot more about medicine in general than we did about the 40s. So we have to change and and. and and be updated with the times here and so modern day uh, uh, biofeedback is a little less invasive we're going to see a picture of that coming up so this is a view from uh, my office several years ago of a patient getting modern uh, biofeedback uh, with a with an uh, bio with surface emg so now we can use external sensors that go on the skin just like an ekg of the wood of the heart we're just putting them on the back part of the pelvic floor and so this lady has sensors uh, right around her tush area um, and but fully clothed and she's able to see her muscle activity on the screen I'm able to watch her watch the uh, activity and I get a lot of data as to what's going on with my patients so I can coach her and train her to do a little better so what were his results uh, you know he so he did this study what how good was it it was phenomenal 93% uh, success rate uh, so successful that the doctors at LA County General Hospital were rumored to pretty much stop doing surgeries and were sending people to Dr. Kegel to try this new thing uh, that he invented that helped with uh, urinary incontinence so he got in a bit of trouble <laughs> uh, from from rocking the uh, financial boat at the hospital so again Totally different uh, um, and interesting uh, history that he went through, but let's take uh, a closer look at what his data uh, teaches us. So he treated people weekly uh, as often as they needed, which uh, we don't really know what that means, uh, but 
probably more than once or twice, and he found that most people would figure out where their pelvic floor is with it, with instruction after 10 to 20 minutes of instruction. So there's problem number one. The average doctor visit these days is six to eight minutes. So you can see where the brochure developed out of necessity, because remember, physical therapists in the United States weren't the one uh, mantling this the way they were in, in uh, Europe and other uh, Commonwealth countries. It was nurses and doctors, so they didn't have the time the way therapists did. Uh, and so this brochure uh, and handout got, became the norm. But remember, it's one-on-one -on -one training that, that made the difference. And, and he found that 25%, uh, one in four, needed considerable patience that means that they took even longer than 10 to 20 minutes. So that's what I mean about the individuality. So if you've been, you've failed a Kegel program or you've even gone through a nurse led program um, at a doctor's office, it's not the same as a physical therapy approach. And it, you still might um, have success if you do try it with a, with a PT. So, so let's take a look at what happened from the 1940s and 50s till to today and why this is not uh, such a, a why pelvic therapy is not a regular thing. So here's some reasons that Dr. Kegel's uh, uh, point in his research got lost to history. Uh, first of all, the wonderful device he invented was expensive uh, back in the day. So in 1948, it was 40 bucks. Um, I have patients today who can't afford an extra 40 bucks for, for something. So you can imagine the impact uh, uh, several decades ago. Lack of access. This, you know, he was making these things in, in the uh, rumor in the garage with his wife and then mailing it to you if you wanted one. So it, there wasn't, it wasn't on Amazon Prime. It wasn't, there wasn't FedEx or it wasn't uh, stocked at your local a drugstore. You had to look for this uh, to, to get it. Um, and then because without the tool being a regular part of the exercise prescription, then they weren't taught correctly. So people were using the wrong muscles, but still thinking they're, they were right. A great example was a urology nurse that I, I saw who told me she was the one that taught kegels at her office. But when she demonstrated what she thought a kegel was, she just bridged her bottom off of the table um, and using her butt cheeks or gluteus maximus, her pelvic floor didn't move at all. She learned that a pelvic floor contraction or kegel was to lift your bottom. Well, anus would be more accurate, but she was lifting the entire tush and not just the little little pelvic floor. So she wasn't get, doing anything to help herself. Um, everybody gets the same dose, which is typically whenever you think about it, which is not effective <laughs> for, for any exercise prescription. And then not everybody should be doing these. Uh, if you have pelvic pain, it's going to be contraindicated um, and, and tell your, your therapist tells you it's okay. And very often it's too little too late. You already have had catechinus syndrome for 10 years and now they're saying it you've already had it's the timing of the advice for the preventative and early care so um, you can imagine somebody that was at the doctors and, and diagnosed with hypertension and then they're, they're being told well yeah you should work out get fit you know can really help your health but if the person came in after a massive stroke maybe caused by that hypertension it's you should work out as a very different kind of thing. You need therapy before you can even get yourself to the gym, let alone on the machines, right? So, so where you are in your health progress really dictates as to how much you can do on your own versus needing a therapist to, to help you. So let's do a little anatomical self-assessment. Where is my pelvic floor? Now, I am not going to teach anybody how to do Kegel exercises because as we just saw, most people can't do this without one-on-one -on -one instruction. So unless I know your history and what's going on with you, it's very difficult for me to instruct you on how to contract your pelvic floor. You may not be doing it right. And if I can't see it or verify it, I think it's irresponsible for me to even, even do that. So, but I do think it's absolutely fine for you to be able to locate and, and palpate your pelvic floor muscles and especially uh, to screen for, uh, for tenderness. Now, some of you with CES that have saddle um, 
paresthesias and, and anesthesia may not feel the same. So look more at what your, you know, if you're having bowel or bladder um, pain and elimination, uh, that sitting pain. It may or may not be, be uh, tender where you're palpating. But on the outside, your pelvic floor lies between your sit bone and your tailbone. So that soft, gooey uh, portion on the inside of your uh, tailbone. Let me get my pointer going here. So, so here's the sit bone. And here's the tailbone. So anywhere in here, you're land, if you're palpating, you're landing on pelvic floor muscle. Now, remember I keep saying the pelvic floor is intertwined with hip muscles. So what you have six hip rotators, one, the piriformis being the most famous of them all, um, but its, it's, uh, it's buddy is the obturator internus, which is an inside pelvic muscle that the pelvic floor side to side suspends from. So the pelvic floor muscles literally are attached to your hip. So this muscle gets missed a lot diagnostically and can be misrepresented as sciatica. So I, if you have sciatica or back pain, one thing I'd love you to rule out is this obturator internus pain. So if you take your, your a cupped hand like this and kind of cup around, let me get a model here. Cup around your sit bone. Let's try to angle my camera here. There we go. So from behind, we're seeing the, the spine and the tailbone. So sit bone here, tailbone there. So we're seeing this whole area being palpable uh, pelvic floor muscle in here. Okay. The obturator internus is behind. So that's what I mean about cupping behind that bony sit bone. Now, if your pain at the sit bone is more on the outside or up higher, it might be hamstring or other hip muscles. But if it's on that inside portion and that really lights you up, that might be an obturator internus muscle problem, which gets misdiagnosed as sciatica, back problems all the time. So that's there's some ways to self-palpate your pelvic floor region. So here we can see more detail of the superficial uh, pelvic floor muscles. So these all tend to cluster together symptom-wise. So this is where your sphincters lie, your external anal sphincter uh, muscles that surround the urethra and vagina. Um, and, and so if somebody says it hurts superficially when I have uh, intercourse, uh, penetrative intercourse, I'm going to be very suspicious as to what's going on with this green muscle here called the bubble cavernosis. So that, that closes the vaginal canal now uh, shut. Um, so that's that would be a clue versus, well, it's deeper. Well, then I might find uh, uh, if I palpate in this deep area that the muscles are, are more tender versus these superficial um, uh, muscles. So when I'm screening a male patient, uh, similar questions I'm going to ask about when and where they hurt uh, during sexual activity. So in, in male patients, if I hear that superficial complaint, um, it's more likely to be at the base of the penis. I'm likely to suspect this green muscle called the bubble spongiosis. Um, it hurts with erections at the tip of my penis. I'm going to be very curious as to what's going on in this red muscle here called the ischiocavernosis because um, that definitely goes into erectile tissue. So you can imagine if a man has an erection then the, the penis is going this way, but the muscles are tight and in and, and a pain state. They're cramped and wanting to stay here, but the tissue and the reflexes are making the tissue stretch. Then there can be this feeling of tightness, uh, especially at the tip of the, at the penis. So if I hear that and, and infections have definitely been ruled out, I'm really going to be very curious as to what's going on in the superficial layer um, in the male anatomy. So you've gone to pelvic health therapy. Um, your therapist has found that you have 
um, an overactive pelvic floor or an underactive pelvic floor, and there's definitely things that we can do to help that, what would a treatment look like? What, what would a treatment plan look like? So many things can be uh, involved, and of course the individuality is important, but behavioral strategies. There's a lot of tips and tricks we teach you, a lot of patient education, uh, uh, mind over bladder uh, uh, strategies is one of my nicknames for them. We do a lot of manual therapy for, uh, especially for overactive uh, uh, pelvic floor muscles, so a lot of massage, for lack of a better word, uh, to tight tissue. But it's not the kind of, it's typically not the relaxing kind of Swedish massage. It's typically targeted uh, to to uh, change tissue. Uh, we can use electrical stimulation to ease pain, uh, to wake up. Uh, muscles. We can use biofeedback to help you see uh, what's going on with the muscles down there. And then, of course, at, at the at the end, everybody is kind of individualized as to how to get back to what they want to in their life, whether they're a couch potato or a competitive athlete, um, and then giving people a self-care uh, program so they don't need me. I always say my job is to work myself out of a job. So, that is not the same as being handed a Kegel brochure. So I hope I hope you uh, can see see the difference uh, now. So. And remember, one of the things we said is that sometimes people will have underactive symptoms and overactive symptoms. So what do you do in that case? So one of the things I want to point out to everybody listening here is that tight muscles are not strong. They are quite weak. Tight muscles don't move, so muscles that don't move over time lose strength, lose endurance, and lose coordination. So pain can start a problem that leads to incontinence due to lack of motion. So I see that order a lot. The pain started, and then lo and behold, I had incontinence. Um, so a lot of times incontinence can hide in pelvic pain syndromes because they get lumped in this pain and um, don't do kegels but then your incontinence never gets treated or people have incontinence and the reason is because of pelvic pain but not everybody has that that really bad sitting pain sometimes it's only sexual pain and if they don't have sex very often they may not perceive themselves as, as having pelvic pain and the incontinence gets uh, lumped in with this underactive kegel surgery drug program and we miss we miss a lot so so tight muscles have to be treated first so no kegels until the pelvic floor muscles have normal length length before strength is my way to help you remember that um, so we're going to need stretching exercises first manual therapy um, um, adaptations to uh, sitting and using toileting aids to make uh, going to the bathroom less painful and certainly less effortful and then of course a home program um, to to make make sure that you can maintain the progress that you've achieved so treatment order matters, length before strength. So manual physical therapy is a huge, huge component uh, to a good pelvic uh, physical therapy treatment plan. Um, and, it, you know, our goal here is to normalize soft tissue restrictions. It's not only the pelvic floor internally that, that is typically worked upon. I do a lot of work in the low belly, the, the groin, the, uh, the inner thighs, um, the, the buttocks, the side of the hips, the low back. They're all intertwined with, with pelvic floor function. So very often they all, they have tightness in a lot of those arenas, not just the pelvic floor. Um, but the, the techniques aren't in any different it's just not an area people think of you know so uh, muscle problems don't stop at the belly button is something that I that I often say or this is typical therapy just not in a, in, a, in a typical region so it's all the same types of techniques it's just adapted to the internal pelvic floor or the, the surrounding external tissue so to augment the what what uh, manual therapy uh, can do uh, we can use tools so the patients can do self internal manual therapy and so they can maintain the progress that they've achieved so if the if they have that superficial uh, pain that that's uh, that opening pain uh, penetration pain I'm going to recommend dilators which will allow them to slowly um, stretch that opening with a bigger and bigger tool and it's gentle it's comfortable and happens over time 
And then uh, if they have deeper pain, I'm going to recommend a curved wand. This The brand name here is TheraWand, and this allows you to uh, get into the deeper muscles with a tool. So it basically is a extension of your finger to allow you to get way back into the deep pelvic floor wall where some of that pain might, might hide. And we also tend to prescribe a lot of adaptive equipment. Um, a seat uh, solutions is a, a brand name of a, of a nice cushion that has kind of a coccyx cut out. Um, so people with that posterior tailbone pain, this is a great cushion. Uh, some people with pedendal neuralgia and a lot of sensitivity within the pelvic floor region uh, will do better with a cushion that has absolutely nothing there. So it kind of props up on the sit bones, but there's this canal of nothingness that allows um, the perineum to just kind of float in the air and not touch anything so there's all kinds of variations so we can we can get 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 you comfortable um, and then um, toileting posturing uh, tools like the squatty potty makes my make my, my, my job a lot easier um, but basically getting your knees above your hips helps you poop better so um, uh, the a high toilet is not good if you have constipation so get your feet uh, underneath you whether you turn over a trash can or wear high heels or something but but elevate uh, your your knees above your hips and you will find that your bowel movements are a bit easier so we have uh, organizations that are promoting pelvic physical therapy as an early and first line of treatment for many of these conditions. So the American Urological Association recommends manual physical therapy as an early treatment for bladder and prostate uh, problems in men and women with the strength of evidence being A and comparison, the medications and bladder installations are only rated uh, a, a B. So, uh, so Therapy is better than the drugs, is what they're what they're telling their urologists. So refer accordingly. Um, the American College of OBGYNs or ACOG recommends referral to pelvic physical therapy for postpartum incontinence and sexual uh, dysfunction as early as the fourth trimester. Uh, it should be the new norm, they say, that physical therapy is involved as early as possible uh, for these conditions. So um, if you, this should give you a lot of confidence in the profession uh, in general, uh, if you are on the patient side of things, and if you are a, a, a referring um, a practitioner, recognize that uh, this, there's a lot of evidence that supports uh, this, this treatment for these types of problems. So how do you find a pelvic PT? Well, you do have to look a little bit. We are we are growing in number, but there's still not that many of us uh, compared to, to general pel uh, physical therapists. But um, uh, you can you can telehealth with me. Uh, that's an option. You can go to my website and book an appointment at your leisure. Uh, and there are lots of locators: uh, pelvicrehab.com, pelvicguru.com. Uh, the American Physical Therapy Association has a find a PT locator and you just put in your zip code and the specialty. Um, but remember, a lot of a lot of us pelvic therapists don't fit well in the classic physical therapy model of the big gym and seeing five patients at the same time. It uh, doesn't work well for, for pelvic health. So a lot of us had to go out on our own, which means we're not associated with a big clinic. So you might have to look a little harder. Um, you might have to uh, go to the second or third third page of Google to uh, to find those uh, smaller clinics. Uh, put in your zip code or your city and then search terms like pelvic floor PT, pelvic physical therapy, um, um, incontinence physical therapy, pelvic pain, men's health, women's health might be some other ones that, that you see. So, so those are some ways to, to locate a pelvic physical therapist like me. So in summary, the research with pelvic floor dysfunction and CES is, is poor. We need a lot more research to uh, see the uh, impact uh, for sure. Uh, but there's lots of diagnostic reasons that somebody might have pelvic pain, uh, bowel and bladder elimination troubles, and sexual dysfunctions. So there's a lot of things to consider, both inside and outside of the pelvis, as contributing factors. And having a pelvic floor assessment by a pelvic health uh, PT can at least rule out overactive pelvic floor muscles as a cause of your tr uh, trouble, and or rule in, and then get some effective treatment. So thank you for joining me. I'm happy to answer answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much.